Okay, recording is on. Welcome back to the second hour on uh, BC 213, the end times. So we'll get started uh, by um, having Samuel ask his question. Samuel, please. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, more of a comment, Pastor, which um, I experienced uh, from first and second semester, where when, when we learn Holy Spirit and gift of tongues, uh, it, so we learn something in the class, but when, when I was talking to other people, that's when I realized that there are other uh, divisions, and some of them don't believe in uh, the gift of tongues and the reason they have. So uh, while you're present in pre tribulation presenting reasons. Also, spending not much, but a little bit of time into why would there be a school of thought that doesn't agree with uh, what you agree on, uh, and what part of the scripture is being misinterpreted. And things like that. Oh, um, Samuel, I kind of um, couldn't hear everything uh, you said. Um, uh, um, let me try to repeat what I was able to get. Uh, I think you said that when we talked about when in the Holy Spirit course in the first year, uh, we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and so on. But then you also found out that you know there are other views on that. Uh, and then what were you saying? I kind of I didn't get it clear. It uh, sorry. Clear. Can you hear me okay now, Pastor? Okay. Yeah. 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 So in the same context, Pastor, uh, when uh, you know you present a, a pre-tribulation theory, uh, I think uh, for me at least, uh, because I don't right now have a particular standing, uh, but probably I was thinking it would be helpful to know why the other school of thought exists, uh, what parts of scripture has been, I think, interpreted differently, so you know, uh, we go with one we we go with one understanding, but then when we encounter only when we encounter someone with a different uh, understanding and and they show certain scriptures, it, it it kind of creates a borderline confusion. So if it if there is in the scope of this course to also see like why some people wouldn't agree, and what 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 would be their uh, statement of confirmation, I think that would also help uh, me hmm. at least. Hmm. Okay, um, sure. So as uh, good, good. So as we go along, um, as we go along this you know, in, in the course, as we progress in the course, I will definitely uh, highlight, uh, you know, uh, why uh, certain people would have a different position uh, based on certain scripture texts, uh, and how, what, why do we, you know, differ from that? Why or differ from that? point of view. So I will definitely highlight that. But um, yeah, but what we won't be able to do is uh, delve in depth, you know, on each of the views, because then that will make it like a very, very long. Uh, and also sometimes perhaps very confusing. Uh, but I will definitely highlight uh, and say, okay, you know, here's here's one reason why there are people, somebody would say there's a mid-tribulation rapture instead of uh, pre-tribulation you know for example when you come to revelation 14 uh, you'll find that there's a jewish people who are caught up there into the heavens and uh, they, they refer to as the first fruits and so some people use that text in revelation 14 to talk about a mid-tribulation rapture you know and then then you come back to revelation 20 and people may use the uh, text over there to talk about a, a that as one of the texts to talk about a post tribulation. So I'll highlight those things as we go along, but it'll be more comments in passing rather than you know, points of emphasis. Uh, okay, I, I will do that. Okay, so any other questions before we continue forward? Uh, all right, so let's go back to the PDF that we were looking at um, just to as we more again, just lay the foundation introduction to this whole thing. So uh, in our approach to studying the end times, uh, as I was mentioning, point number three, uh, there is openness, meaning we are aware that there are different positions 
uh, but uh, uh, I'm also stating up front the position that I'm coming from or from which this course is going to be presented uh, because of my my own persuasion of it. Uh, and But then we are open uh, to listening to other positions and so on. Okay. And uh, so uh, what are the positions? What are the different positions? Uh, these are just the main ones. Okay. There's not all. that. There are just, just, just so many other <laughs> other kinds of uh, positions people take. Uh, anyway, so the main one, uh, so the, the, the dispensational pre-millennialism. So it means we are supporting two things. We are supporting a, a, a dispensational understanding of scripture, and I will explain that a little later on. Uh, that means dispensation simply means ages or time periods, right? So we are saying that uh, in God, in the outworking of God's plan with the human race, there are distinct uh, dispensations or ages or time periods. So for instance, right now, we are in the dispensation of the church or the church age or the time period of the church. So that's the meaning of the word dispensational. Um, we explain it a little later on, okay? And pre-millennialism, that means we, there is the millennial, the thousand year reign of Christ. We believe in that, a literal thousand year reign of Christ. And we also believe in a pre millennialism. That means before the reign of Christ, there's going to be the tribulation, but we also believe in a pre tribulation uh, return of Christ for the church, that the rapture of the church. Okay, So that means we are, what we are saying is there's going to be the rapture of the church, then the tribulation, then the thousand year reign of Christ. Right. So that's, in summary, this position. That is dispensational pre-millennialism. Then there is a different position that which has been, is referred to as historical pre millennialism because um, the, uh, this was a position or uh, um, held by some of the early church fathers, including uh, Irenaeus, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, so on. So what did they think? They understood that the return of Christ uh, would, uh, would be just before the millennial the thousand year reign and uh, but it would be at the end of the seven year tribulation so they you know, so in, in in modern terms it would be referred to as post tribulation pre millennialism so historical pre millennialism is the same as what we would refer to as a post tribulation as they said or they understood as the church will go through the seven year tribulation, then Jesus would come and usher in the thousand year reign. So that was the traditional understanding. And uh, so I will explain as we go along why we believe in, why we differ from this. Why do we believe in a pre tribulation? rapture of the church and uh, why we take that position. I will explain that. I'll give you reasons. Then there's another position. Now, don't get confused by all this. It's just that, you know, people uh, have a different understanding of where certain events would take place in the, in the prophetic timeline. And that's why there are these different positions. But generally, we all agree on the coming of Christ, on the fact that there is going to be a tribulation, there is going to be a millennial reign, and we all agree with that. Um, the post-millennialism uh, believe that uh, this millennial is not a literal thousand-year reign uh, uh, where he will, he will rule, but they believe that it's the gradual progressive spread of the gospel uh, throughout the uh, the earth and which is happening and then christ will return 
at the end of this uh, uh, you know this this so called I mean they don't look at it as a literal thousand years so we just a millennial uh, it's it's thousands of years where the gospel is going to be spreading and um, the gospel will increase all over the earth and then Jesus will come and he will you know the, the great white throne judgment will happen so that's the position of the post millennialism so basically they look at a thousand years thousand year reign which revelation 20 talks about not as a literal thousand year reign but as a time period where the gospel is being extended on the earth uh, into the lives of people and then after that time period is over jesus will return okay that's this position and the last one that uh, just to be aware of is uh, what is referred to as an a uh, millennialism that means uh, it doesn't mean that uh, they don't believe in the millennial reign what they believe what they believe is in a nav millennial reign that means uh, it's 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 happening from the time the church uh, that jesus defeated uh, 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 jesus rose from the dead on he's reigning but he's reigning uh, through his church and uh, and then you know they just just we just move into this um, this time when Satan will be taken out of the way and we move into the eternal kingdom. So they are looking at it as from the resurrection of Christ on. Right. So it almost it's like. A millennialism meaning they don't believe in the millennial, but what they are saying is from the time Christ rose from the dead, his reign began and it will continue. And then he will just usher us into, he will take care of the wicked and he will usher us into, you know, uh, the eternity future. So it's in one sense, uh, this whole thousand year reign uh, is, is, it's like it started off. From the resurrection of Christ, and uh, it will continue through till the end of this age, and Christ will come, judge every all of us, and take us into eternal. So that's another position. Um, now we, you know, we 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 respect people who have different positions. It's okay. We're not going to argue and fight. Uh, with each other on this but of course there are certain things we cannot compromise that means we cannot compromise on the reality of God's kingdom and so I just listed some other things here right uh, uh, see so we cannot compromise on these things that means there is the nation of Israel there is the church there's his covenant of grace God has his covenant people we all have one hope, one faith, one Lord, one spirit. Christ will return. That's clearly stated in the Bible. Now, we may uh, differ on when he returns, on our understanding of when he returns, but he's going to return. Um, there is going to be the resurrection of the dead. We, the Bible states that very clearly. People are going to be judged. The Bible states it very clearly. There are going to be new heavens and a new earth, very clear. So these are things we we cannot take away it's there in scripture uh, when these things or you know the sequence of events people may differ in their views and as we read scripture you will understand why but the fact is these the things that are stated are stated and will happen so we can't do away with that right christ will return there will be the judgment there will be new heavens and the new earth and also looking back, uh, Jesus is Lord. His work on the cross cannot be negated and people have to receive him as savior and there is the responsibility of the Great Commission. So these are things uh, we cannot compromise. Uh, we hold to these uh, as truth, but we will definitely be open 
uh, to you know uh, uh, people who have different views and positions. Now, as I stated earlier, the approach we are coming from, or our position, is dispensational premillennialism. So we're talking about uh, understanding God's working uh, with the uh, with the human race in in terms of ages and dispensations, and we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Okay, um, so just to explain to us the 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 uh, the, the dispensation. So we believe that when when God's working with the human race, there are ages. Uh, uh, that you know, there was the time of innocence before the fall. There was a time of conscience uh, until the flood. Then there was human government and the promise given to Abraham, bringing up, uh, taking, going through all the way till Moses came. Then the law was given, Moses to Christ, and Christ came. He ushered in grace, the, what we refer to the age of grace or the church age. And then we also believe in the millennium, the kingdom age, when Christ will rule physically on earth as king, right? So these are just broadly speaking, broad um, ages or time periods of God's dealing with man. And we believe in this. So it's called dispensation or dispensational. So we do believe in a literal thousand year reign of Christ. We believe in that. He is actually going to reign on earth for a thousand years. And, you know, we, we see that in scripture. So dispensational and a view, a dispensational view. And then pre-millennial, that means we believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Okay. A couple of other, other thoughts to keep in mind as we um, study Bible prophecy is uh, we will take a complete view of scripture. So we, when we look at an event, we want to look at all the scriptures that speak about that event, rather than um, looking at things in isolation. Example, when we talk about uh, the Antichrist entering into the temple, then you need, we need to read what Daniel said about this man, because Daniel wrote about, or Daniel prophesied, Daniel wrote. We need to read what Jesus said about this abomination of desolation, referring to the Antichrist. We need to read what Paul wrote uh, in Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2 about the abomination of desolation and read what John wrote in Revelation about the abomination of desolation. So in trying to understand what the, the Antichrist, we have to look at all the scriptures that speak about the Antichrist. So we don't just take Revelation in isolation to understand the Antichrist, no. Because Daniel spoke about him, Jesus spoke about him, Paul spoke, wrote about him, and Revelation, John writes about him. So we put all of that together in, to understand, okay, here's what the Antichrist will do, right? Because if you take just any one of these passages in isolation to, to formulate what the Antichrist will do, then we could go off on a tangent, but uh, we, could, you know, we could just say things that may not be in agreement to the entirety of scripture. Very interesting, for instance, Daniel uh, pinpoints to us, you know, where the Antichrist will come from. You know, he talks about the Roman Empire, um, uh, which was broken down into, uh, which later on was taken on by the Greek, Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire, which was later on broken down into four parts. Um, and then he says, from one of these four parts comes this little horn, who then overpowers the others uh, and becomes the Antichrist. So we can actually look at Daniel's text 
and narrow it down and say, hey, uh, this was where the Greek empire was. And sure enough, after Alexander the Great died, whom Daniel prophesied about, um, his empire was divided into four parts, exactly as Daniel prophesied about. And so these are the four parts uh, geographically today from which this anti-crash is going to come from. You know, so we have that information that and then, you know, you'll find other things which Jesus spoke about, Paul spoke about, John spoke about, and and then we put all together and say, okay, this is what we can say about the Antichrist. So we're going to do that. We're going to take a complete view on scripture as we interpret. Number five is uh, we, we want to look at both the Old and the New Testament, right? So end time prophecy should be understood with both the old and the new together right so uh, we need to keep these uh, together as we study end time prophecy because you know uh, you'll find not only did daniel write about it but there's prophecy in isaiah in jeremiah in ezekiel in zechariah in joel all these have end time prophecies and so uh, we need to look at all those scriptures as we understand um, end time prophecies um, number six uh, we want to use biblical typology. So uh, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier that um, when there are these figures, images, important, stay with what the scriptures say about it. Right? So, for example, and, uh, you know, uh, and I, I, I may have mentioned this in our course on hermeneutics uh, uh, last, I forget one of the earlier semesters, yeah, um, that, uh, you know, for example, Revelation 17 talks about mystery Babylon, this, this woman who sits on the waters, on the seas. So, so okay, what is this waters? Then in that same chapter, but in a later verse, in verse 15, it says, well, the waters and the seas represents peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So in that same chapter, there's the interpretation of what is the water or what is the seas? It is representing, you know, nations, peoples, all of people around the world. So uh, we interpret, so we can interpret waters and seas as nations because it's already interpreted for us in scripture. Just one example, but like this, uh, you know, uh, uh, the typology or the image should be interpreted within the constraints of scripture. Okay. Um, number seven, uh, we also want to recognize that there are different time frames in uh, a single text even sometimes in a single verse of scripture, right? And uh, that means in one verse of scripture, there will be things spoken of in one period of time, something stated which was supposed to happen in another period of time. A classic example, which we refer to often is Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. You know, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. That's going to happen later on, but it's in one verse, right? So Jesus was born 2000 years ago, but him carrying the government literally on his shoulder will happen in time to come, right? And we also see, for instance, uh, we will look in Isaiah 65, a very interesting passage. Uh, it's talking about uh, new heavens and a new earth. And then it's talking about, you know, uh, how things will look um, in the millennium. So it's all in one passage, but it's talking about two different time periods. It's talking about a time period in the millennium, and it's talking about a time period in the new heavens and the, uh, and the new earth. But it's given as one portion of scripture, and we need to recognize different time frames when we see it clearly, and we have to interpret it in the rest of scripture, you know, along with Revelation. So that's something we must learn to do. Another important thing uh, we have to keep in mind is uh, to recognize a near and far fulfillment. 
So uh, there is an immediate fulfillment uh, and there is also a future fulfillment of things uh, that will happen. Uh, so this example of this would be in Ezekiel uh, when it's talking about uh, uh, Israel coming back into their own land from captivity, but it's also referring to about a future regathering of Israel as a nation in their own land. And so these are given to us in chapters one alongside you know, each other. Um, and, and, and we need to look at it and say, okay, so this is immediate fulfillment. This is future fulfillment for these reasons. Right? So we need to recognize that as well. And lastly, uh, uh, I just want to mention that, look, th that there could be unexpected ways for fulfillment that God may surprise us you know, that how this is going to be fulfilled. You know, an example would be in Revelation chapter 11. It's talking about the two witnesses whom God will send uh, and they will be uh, ministering uh, towards the second half of the seven-year tribulation. So they, they, are, they, 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 they come on the scene in Revelation 11 uh, when the temple has been desecrated. And Revelation takes us, chapter 11 takes us through the whole you know, the, the ministry of these two um, witnesses. And then it says there that when they are killed and their bodies are on the streets in Jerusalem, it says the whole world will see them. Now, you know, maybe, uh, let's say maybe 50 years ago, how would that happen? You know, it's like, hey, how can the whole world see two people who are dead in the streets of Jerusalem? But today, you know, uh, with uh, not today, but maybe maybe you know, with with time, say, thirty years ago or something like that, you know, with with television and with uh, subsequently with the internet and so on, uh, and with the communications that we have, sure, if two people are lying dead in Jerusalem, the whole world can see them, because of the technology we have. But you know, maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, that would not be possible, right? Uh, uh, but now we can see that some of the things stated in Revelation 11 can actually be happen in our time. Now, uh, this is an unexpected way, but it's it actually is a fulfillment, or will be a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So just keep you know keep ourselves minds open to those things. And uh, lastly, it is that. Uh, yeah, it is true that, you know, our understanding of the timing of certain things can change uh, as things become clearer, they may be, you know, possible to change. So I don't want to, you know, say that my way is the right way. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to do that, but we want to do it very humbly, respectfully, uh, and say that this is, this is why we believe what we believe, uh, uh, things will happen in this sequence of events. Okay, uh, uh, last two things, just before we close up this chapter, is um, some things, you know, uh, we don't subscribe to. Um, uh, uh, you know, there is a position, like I said, uh, I may have mentioned this a little earlier, uh, there is a position uh, where uh, uh, preterism where they say that all the prophecies concerning the last days were fulfilled in the first century, starting on from there. It's all done, over. And uh, so we don't subscribe to that, obviously. Otherwise, uh, you know, we won't be looking into the future, looking at how these prophecies uh, could be fulfilled. Um, there's another position, uh, often referred to as uh, dominion theology, uh, where uh, the, they believe that um, it's kind of the, a derivative of, you know, uh, some of the earlier positions where they believe that um, the church is going to be the one taking dominion over the nations and Jesus is going to rule through the church. And so, you know, when it talks about the millennial kingdom, it's really talking about the church being in charge. And so the church must go in and take over all the nations 
and the apostles will govern the nations. So, um, you know, and now this, this, this more or less has died out, but you might hear about it in some places, but we don't uh, subscribe to that. We believe in Jesus coming back literally to rule and reign on the earth. Uh, and he's not going to be, uh, of course, the saints are going to serve under him uh, in the kingdom, but it is Jesus who's going to be here on the earth ruling and reigning. Let me pause here. Uh, this may be a little heavy. Uh, are, are you all with me so far? Uh, don't worry, it's not going to be always this heavy. Everyone's fine? Okay. Let me... Yeah, we are with you. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks, thanks, Charles. Let me look at the questions that have come in. Um, there is a uh, DBS question. Um, so these different views are based on the views regarding the timeline of rapture with regard to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Is that right? Okay. So for the most part, that is the big difference, Divya. The, uh, the, the positioning or the timing of certain events, that's all, right? So that's why it's called, you know, pre-millennial, post-millennial, or uh, pre-trib or mid-trib, you know, it's a slight positioning on when certain events would take place. So based on that, there are these differing views. Or, you know, generally speaking, that is the main uh, reason for these differing positions. Because like we said, you know, God didn't say, you know, in AD 2040, I will come. And in AD 2070, this will happen. He didn't give us those dates. And that's why there is this room for, you know, a, a differing view. Okay. But uh, most people believe in a literal fulfillment of the sequence of events. They believe in the rapture of the church. They believe in Christ coming back. They believe in, you know, the resurrection of the dead. They believe in a, in a literal reign of Christ. Now, some may, like I like we mentioned today, uh, some may differ in the millennial reign. You know, like we said, some may say, well, it started from his resurrection or he's reigning through the church, things like that. But we, most people believe in a literal thousand year reign of Christ. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, we come. Uh, Christopher's question. Will there still be a rapture in historical pre-millennialism? The answer is yes, Christopher. Uh, the differing part was uh, what they believed was, they believed that the rapture would happen at the end of the tri tribulation. So that's historical pre-millennialism. That means, it would happen at the end of the tribulation before the millennium. So that's the difference, right? So the position we are going to be presenting is the rapture takes place before the seven year tribulation. Historical premillennialism believes or believed that the rapture will take place at the end of the tribulation before the millennium. So that's what uh, their position was. And some people subscribe to that even today, right? Okay, let's see, any more questions? Okay, so Charles, um, there's, uh, a, I'd say something about replacement theology. So Charles, um, uh, in a sense, what replacement theology's summary is, the church has replaced Israel. That's in summary. Uh, do we subscribe to it? No. We believe, and, and Paul brings this out very clearly in Romans chapters 9, 10, 11, that the church has not replaced Israel. But God is working with both the nation of Israel and with the church. And that's why I think in one of the, somewhere in the notes I mentioned that we believe in God is still working with Israel 
and God is working with the church, but he's, he's bringing us to become one new man. That means we're all, everyone who's born again, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, we all are brought into Christ. But we don't believe that God has taken his hands off of Israel and the church has replaced Israel. No, we believe God is still working with both. And uh, Paul, Paul states that very clearly in Romans 9, 10, 11. Is that okay, Charles? Another question from Charles. I hear of the sign of two fingers that Jesus flashed as multiples of two. Um, what is your saying? Sorry, Charles, I haven't heard of that, so I don't know uh, what this is happening. Uh, you, you, you see the, the people, like I think it's, it's maybe speculation or something like sensational. They flashed two fingers that when Jesus was leaving the apostles, he flashed two fingers, meaning two days, two weeks. So people kept on waiting for him two years, 20 years, 200 years, now 2,000, things like that. So you have never heard of it. So if you have never, then it is no problem. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I haven't heard of that. All right, Maggie, what's your question, please? Thank you, sir. Um, question is on uh, the two witnesses in Jerusalem and the temple. Because uh, it says that when they will be killed, they will, the, the whole world will see. And that will be after the temple has been discredited. I think, I think that's the right word. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, if Christ, Christ died for us and made the temple on earth uh, useless or unusable, or we don't need the temple anymore, a physical temple. So how is it possible that the third temple that uh, Jewish will build would be regarded as a holy place by God? Mm. And mm. So was it that uh, does the Bible here, does it is, is using the the word temple is a figurative figure, uh, just is a figure or is it literal temple? <clears throat> Sorry. And mm. secondly, are those two witnesses, are they going to be actually human being or just add another figure of speech that God used to teach us something? Thank mm. you. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, this question is really jumping way ahead into the course. Uh, but uh, and we are going to come to this. We are going to come to it. You know, as we go through the sequence of events, we will come to it. But I'll just go ahead and answer your question. Um, so, why do we say it's going to be literal temple? Because, uh, okay, let me back up and say this. First of all, Daniel's seventieth week. You read about this in Daniel chapter nine, uh, verses twenty-six, twenty-seven. Daniel's 70th week, and we will explain this later on when we get into the text of the scripture. The 70th week of Daniel, which is a period of seven weeks or seven years. So Daniel's 70th week, period of seven years, deals exclusively with the nation of Israel, or I would say primarily deals with the nation of Israel. So Daniel's 70th week, and as you will read in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, 27, um, deals with the nation of Israel. Uh, the Bible also calls this the time of Jacob's trouble. That means it's a time of oh, Jacob. Jacob is Israel, Israel's trouble. Um, so it has to do with the nation of Israel. Uh, now, what happens in the desecration of the temple? Very clearly, Daniel tells us, Jesus tells us, Paul tells us, and Revelation John tells us, the Antichrist goes into the temple, sets himself up to be worshipped. So it cannot be a figurative thing. It has to be a literal temple. And uh, Daniel specifically says that the sacrifices will be stopped. You know, so uh, the, um, that means the sacrifices are going on and they will be stopped. So again, literal temple. Revelation 11 again talks about the Gentiles 
trampling down in the temple. So to Gentiles, the world, people of the world coming in and trampling the temple. So again, there's a literal temple. Plus, when you look past that, when you look into Daniel chapter 12, and also when you look into Ezekiel chapters 40 to uh, the last four chapters of Ezekiel, so that is, uh, I think, 44 to 48, uh, it talks about this millennial temple, meaning the temple practices are continuing in the millennium. During the thousand year reign, the temple will be there and sacrifices will be offered in the temple during the millennium. So it's not only the temple during the tribulation, which has which has to be a physical temple for these reasons. It has to be desecrated. Sacrifices was being offered. The Gentiles are going to trample down. But you also find the temple in Ezekiel continuing on, the sacrifices continuing on during the millennium. So obviously the question is, why? Because, like we said earlier, God is working in the church, but he hasn't stopped working with Israel as a nation. And one of the reasons... And Daniel clearly tells us, you know, in Daniel 12, about this temple being, uh, being there. And one of the reasons is, uh, the scriptures don't state it, but we can think that probably God is going to use as a constant reminder to the nation of Israel about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's probably a reason why there's going to be a millennial temple with sacrifices continuing during the millennium uh, uh, for this reason, right? Uh, uh, to remind them about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So to answer your question, the temple, as we understand it, as we see in the scripture, is a literal temple. Uh, the two witnesses are literal people because uh, you find uh, in Revelation 11 describing that they have a ministry that impacts the world. Um, uh, they are, they, they, you know, they, they do signs, wonders, and miracles. Uh, they are physically killed. The world rejoices at seeing them, you know, die. And also because, you know, you, we have other references in Malachi chapter 4, where Malachi says, I, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great day of the Lord, right? So we know, Malachi said, Elijah will come before the coming of the great day of the Lord. And the Lord Jesus also attested to this in Matthew, the 17th chapter, when he said, Elijah has come and indeed will come. So when he said Elijah has come, he was referring to John the Baptist who came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but he didn't stop there. He said, and he will come. That means, Malachi chapter 4 will literally be fulfilled with Elijah coming. So Jesus in Matthew 17 affirmed that Elijah will come, right? So this has to be the literal uh, Elijah uh, coming back. I hope I answered your question, Mangi. We will look into this as we go forward. Thank you, sir. You, you, you answered my question. Thank you, sir. Okay. I think we'll have time for one last question. Divya, what is your question, please? Thank you, Pastor. So it is uh, with regard to Matthew 24, 32 to 35. Uh, here in that uh, reference, uh, the generation that has been mentioned, mm. uh, uh, is it in a different time frame with respect to G what Jesus' time period? Mm. Uh, like, is it uh, an example of a different time frame or like... Um, uh, considering the time when Jesus spoke about this. Hmm. Interesting. Um, again, we will, we will uh, look at this at, as one of the signs. And, uh, you know, uh, people who study end times like this, this reference a lot uh, because it kind of gives us some numbers to work with. And I will just put these numbers out for you. I am not uh, telling us to work the math and uh, determine the year, but generally people who study prophecy use this passage to work with numbers. And I'll just tell you what it is. So what Jesus said is, he said, when you see the fig tree blossom, the time of the end is near, and that generation will see everything happen. 
Matthew 24, and uh, we are supposed to have, we think we'll read it next week. So the fig tree blossom, fig tree is a symbol of Israel in, in, in Bible, in, in scripture, right? So the fig tree blossoming, Israel becoming a nation. So people could, uh, people usually pick one of two dates. Now they either pick the year 1947, yeah? Or uh, they pick 1967 when Israel recaptured Jerusalem, whatever. So, you know, people use either of these two years. And then they add to that one generation. How long is a generation? So some people may say it's 40 years. Uh, some people may say it's 120 years, you know, uh, because of Genesis 6. Okay, whatever. So people play with these numbers, right? So you add 120 to 1947, or you had 120 to 1967, or you add uh, 40 years or things like that. And they say, okay, so this is around the time when Christ would come, because he said one generation, the generation that sees the fig tree blossom, will see everything come to pass, right? So it is an indicator, uh, you know, to some extent, you can play with numbers uh, around that. Uh, but uh, we should not get speculative, as we mentioned, right? But it's a good indicator that, um, you know, the generation that sees Israel blossom, that generation will see all these things come to pass. Uh, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, sure. yes. Okay. yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, one last question, and we, we will stop after this. Christopher's question. One of the key sequence of events is the temple being with the Jews, which is now occupied by the Muslims, and that then the temple will be desecrated by the Antichrist. This has happened before the rapture. Okay. So... Um, the answer to this question is we don't know exactly when this will happen. Meaning, so right now we know that uh, at, in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the major part of it is occupied by the Arabs, the Muslims, right? They have the Al-Aqsa Al -Aqsa Mosque that's been built there. And there is the uh, the Temple Dome. The only access the Jews have is to the uh, the wall, the Western Wall, uh, where they can come and pray. But the rest of the Temple Mount is occupied by the Muslims. Now that is where Solomon's Temple was, and that is where the third somewhere there, somewhere there on the Temple Mount, there has to come the third temple. And in that third temple, sacrifices have to restart. And in that third temple, the Antichrist would come and set himself up to be worshipped. So this is a very difficult thing, a very difficult thing. How are the Jews going to have access to the Temple Mount when right now there are two huge monuments belonging to Muslims standing right there. How are they going to get, get access to it? How is it ever going to be possible? We don't know. But the fact that there is going to be a literal temple, like we just said earlier, uh, is there in scripture. When exactly is this going to happen? Is it going to happen before the rapture or after the rapture, again, we don't know. But one thing we do know, as soon as the rapture takes place, Revelation chapter four and five, Revelation chapter six, verse one begins with the emergence of the Antichrist. The first seal that's opened, Revelation six, one, is the man riding on a white horse, and that's the Antichrist. So Revelation 4 and 5, rapture of the church. Revelation 6, 1, the beginning of the tribulation, the beginning of the seven year, the first thing is the emergence of the Antichrist. 
Will the temple be in existence at that time? Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us clearly. But by the time we reach Revelation 11, the temple is there. Now, one of the things that brings the man Antichrist into power is he comes as a man of peace and he signs a covenant or he signs a treaty of peace, Daniel chapter 9, which means that it is likely that once the Antichrist comes into power, or the thing that brings him to power is his peace treaty. Now, we don't know what this peace treaty is, but it's something that seems to bring peace to this problem in the Middle East. So we could just speculate or just imagine maybe part of what he does is to facilitate the you know, bringing in of the temple, the restoring of the establishing of the sacrifices, because it is in his time that the sacrifices are started and it is three and a half years later in his time that he brings an end to the sacrifices. So we could say that maybe the Antichrist in his emergence to power is somehow instrumental in settling things in some sort of, you know, a seemingly peaceful way between the Jews and the Arabs, which is what brings him into power. But the church has been taken out of the way before that, right? So my answer to your question, Christopher, is we don't know for sure whether the temple is built before the rapture or after the rapture. My guess, it's a guess, it's that it's most likely going to be built after the rapture when the Antichrist comes into power because he is instrumental in setting up a treaty, a covenant of peace and bringing in the sacrifices. So he has a part to play uh, in setting those things up. That's my guess or you know my understanding of scripture. Is that okay? All right, um, we'll pause here for today. Uh, we will continue this. Uh, uh, next week, Charles, I see your question. What is your advice on the temptation of sensationalism and speculation? People want to bring, uh, yeah, yeah, just avoid it. You know, study it objectively. Uh, study the scriptures humbly, knowing that we don't know everything. Uh, we may not be right on everything, but we are doing our best to understand scripture and, uh, and intentionally avoid being sensational and speculative on things okay all right let's pause um okay anita ask, asking question reference for pre-tribulation rapture so anita we will give about 10 references i think it's coming up in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a later chapter uh, we will go through it in detail okay and i will give you all the notes and the references for that so i uh, try to prove prove that uh, yeah okay so it'll come up. Let's pause here for today. I want somebody to please uh, close in prayer and then we will dismiss, please. Who would like to pray? Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for today's study. Lord, as we do not know, the exact position. What will happen in the end time? Lord, we need to come to a best understanding according to the revelation we have received through your word, Father. Thank you, Lord, for teaching this the best understanding for our pastor. Lord, help us to understand in detail in the coming classes about this end time problem so that we may dwell in the truth of your world. Bless Pastor Lord, anointing the spirit to teach us rightfully so every one of us may be equipped and have a rightful understanding and the best understanding according to the scriptures so that we may be established in our faith, Father. 
that we have a strong base and a strong conviction about our about the future events that we may be blessed for we may be assured and we may await your return at all times and be watchful for your return means for in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you thank you everyone enjoy uh, the rest of the day rest of the afternoon i'll see you again god bless bye now